Our goal for the time being is definitely simple. We have to sell Bullstair somewhere in four days. As mediators, we will propose the most reasonable price and ensure that negotiations for the acquisition go smoothly. Dr. Wallace guide us from Gazanika's office to the room where Marco and the others were said to be working. In any case, it will be a large discount, something that even I might want to buy. Do you think it'll go well? A bout of the skill will be difficult even during normal times, right? If you mean will the buyout be approved, we don't have any choice but to make it happen. You probably understand, too, how important an investment bank it is. It's like a poor bull in a china shop. It's on the verge of falling, and we cannot let that happen. Wallace said this, but let out a sigh that sounded more like a groan. But if you're asking if it'll go smoothly, I am pretty sure we will face problems. It's just too hasty. Couldn't believe my ears. It's even more suspicious than a phone scam announcing the discovery of a cure for cancer. But why did it come to this? It can't be that it's the payment for their loss in our gamble. Hearing my question, Wallace laughed, his shoulders shaking. Does it hurt your conscience? No, it's just that. It would have been a little better if that were the case. The more I hear about this, the more it feels like a bank run. Wallace turned towards me, shrugging. I did not understand it either. For the first time in a while, I was making phone calls everywhere. After he said this, he explained. Did you hear about the fund affiliated with Bull going bankrupt? I just saw it on the news, but it was a real estate fund, right? Yes, and that's what started it all. Wallace said it so easily, but I did not understand. That affiliated fund was like the rocket Chris had drawn. It should have been something extra hanging off the bottom of the main part, i.e. the huge bank. The news said they went bankrupt because of loss of 1.5 billion moles. That loss was probably dead, but it was unlikely they were burning their borrowed money to keep themselves warm. The value of the stock and the real estate they bought with that money probably hadn't ended up being zero, and the real damage must have been smaller. Moreover, the sheer scale of the business of the main part, the bank, was literally extraordinary, so I could not imagine that just two affiliated funds going bankrupt would threaten to sink the main part itself. It was like a bulky man hemorrhaging because of a mosquito bite dying. I'm pretty sure the vice president of Bull, who was called Old Beardy, still has no idea he caused it all. That idiot heard his company would go bankrupt in four days, panicked and called to the government. He said he was born on Earth. That's probably why he thought the government would do something. Wallace was laughing ironically. Here's what happened. A fund affiliated with Bullstairs is gathering money from investors on Earth. CP. He was fundraising by selling short-term securities. And with the money gathered, he was buying real estate or real estate loans. This part is nothing special for us. Yeah, that's why we have even more trouble understanding it. And this fund was most likely selling those loans, turning them into securities like ABS. If Barn had not taken it from me, I would have made a profit from this bankruptcy with my protection. It would have been the fund's loss, of course. But even then, how did it get to a point where the main part, Bullstairs, would die four days later? The problem was that the money they borrowed was unreliable. Well, unreliable isn't really the right word. It would be better to say it wasn't certain. Since they were borrowing money on short term, they had to refinance all the time in order to continue their business. Of course, as long as their clients continued to buy their CP and lend them money, it was not a problem. However, it didn't go well this time. Loans limited to short term like this are made in order to provide an escape in case something happens after all. Yes. So they were making us think that they were spending money on crazy investments, but in fact they were still being cautious. That's why the interest on long term loans was so high. After all, can't know what will happen during that long a time span. It was a short time investment. If it was a short time investment, you could evaluate the situation and pull the funds out immediately. And now the real estate market was crumbling. That was clear for everyone to see. In that case, now was the time to exert caution. That's why the fund got into this difficult situation. Their liquidity dried up suddenly. Since they were proceeding under the premise that they could refinance their funds, they were suddenly unable to pay for the real estate they had acquired. Finally, they borrowed money from other banks using the real estate as security, since during the last days they were constantly receiving requests for individual securities. Since the real estate market was only going down, the lenders of their investments asked for additional securities. When New Age Development went bankrupt, it was exactly the same process. And they also had their payments to us, right? 
Holmes kept talking as he walked through the hallway, suppressing a smile. The guys at the fund were in deep trouble, and they finally showed up in their mother company with a host of lawyers. They were saying that when the fund was established, a contract was signed, and then it contained a relief clause in case of emergency. The herd, unable to change diapers, because someone would take responsibility for the losses. The more risks they take, the more profit they turn up. At least that's what Marco had said about them. Those were the same people who'd been making the most noise at Club 25. And both stairs had to back them, and they were brought down together. No. Well, it shook his head. They abandoned them. They gave them just enough backing to respect the clause in the contract and cut them off. What they needed right then was something like a few hundred million moles, but two funds went into this exact situation at the same time, and they decided that it was too dangerous to carry at all. After that, the real estate market was in the middle of aggravating its losses, and it was easy to predict that more payments of cash would be required one after another. It was just like carrying a black hole. That's why, in my opinion, the best solution for their management was to cut it off and make the investors cover the losses. As a result, both funds filed for bankruptcy. But why did it have such a negative impact? As soon as I said that, I realized why. It was one of the few unwritten laws that ruled this world. We've worked in the business of making cars, growing vegetables, or building furniture. If a fire broke out at a factory, you just had to close it. If a field was damaged, you had to start growing in another. However, in our world, everything came down to moving money based on the same data across the board. The participants were all of the same bread and my breed, and everything was built upon trust. Everything was connected. Even if you had a contract saying that you had to offer your support in times of need, you did not do it. All you had to do was provide just enough backing to be able to win if you were sued. It was really the action of a cunning member of the financial world. Effectively, if you followed the basic rule of this world that nothing mattered as long as you gained profit, Bolster's decision was the most fitting. It was hard, very hard, to recover a position once it began to expand its losses. To recover a loss of 50%, you need to get 100% profit with the rest of your funds, and you couldn't recover a 70% loss unless you made at least 200% profit. Profit and loss were not of equal value in this world. That's why it was better to reset everything than to provide more support and make things worse. As they had made enough profit, they just looked the other way, thinking the investors would cover the losses. And that's what they said. This is a rule of the world, right? But this was the philosophy of the most ruthless people of the world of finance. What did the others think? The refined investors, investors of Earth, or those who did not have such a radical philosophy? This is what they probably thought. Bullstairs did not cover its affiliated fund. Why? It was probably because Bullstairs itself was in danger. With the fund going bankrupt, they thought the main part was in danger. That's right. I don't know why, but around the time of the bankruptcy, rumors were already spreading on Earth within the financial industry. Rumors that Bullstairs possessed great amounts of dangerous assets that weren't all that different from those held by the bankrupt fund. Just with this. No, of course, that wasn't the only reason. The problem was of a way larger scale than just bull stairs. I myself only found out about it when I called up an old friend from Earth. You mean... According to my friend from Earth, since the medical report, all the Earth-based in in Earth investors have been watching the situation on the lunar surface and holding their breath. It's understandable. After all, they th all thought there was an endless flow of immigrants coming here, and they rather innocently thought the price of land would go up forever. Their fears became reality when the fund went bankrupt. As soon as they saw this, they all understood that the real estate market would inevitably crumble. That very same day, almost all the major investors from Earth started shifting from investing in real estate to pulling out their funds. Well, it's logical to run away from the investment spelling danger, and you can go as far as to say they acted as a good investor should under the circumstances. Indeed, what was the problem then? Almost answered my question with Paul the problem was that, in the current state of global affairs, there is no one who's not investing in real estate. In other words, the capital flow toward petty every, pretty much every city in the world just stopped in that instant. Companies with room for error could handle this, but others were simply unlucky and weren't able to. Bullstairs themselves have been investing in real estate in the issue in ABS. They obviously also had contracted debts. With the extra collateral demands and the insurance payments, 
They must have used up all their available cash at incredible speed. It was just like rats fleeing a sinking ship. And when they tried to call for assistance from their surroundings, said surroundings available cash was also dried up. After that, it was basically a self-fulfilling prophecy. Seems so. Right now, Cabal has to be put away at an incredible speed every time you blink. If there was a prophecy claiming that a certain company was going down, people would pull out their capital and assets, which would in turn cause it to actually collapse. That was the exact trap into which Eleanor's company fell. I couldn't know whether Bullstairs was really in trouble or not. What I knew was that since they didn't want to carry losses, they made the decision to force the collapse of their fund. While that decision was sound in principle, it was a mistake, strategically speaking. Because of this trivial error of judgment that he made, the huge main body, Bull Stairs, was facing quite the predicament. So, well, it was an accident. An accident. Yes, indeed an accident. So everyone was just holding their breath while they were watching it, and then they wouldn't spread the bad news first. Poor Bull Boo Hoo. Is that the picture they're trying to paint? Before it got out that the main body was in trouble, no one could predict how much the stock would drop. I see. So for the buyer, it's better to stall for time and wait for the stock price to drop, because then they get an excuse to buy it cheaper. Yes, but there is also the possibility that the shareholders of Bullstairs in their desperation will refuse the buyout. Kazunika fears this might happen, so he called us. But is it really going to happen? They must be fully aware of the seriousness of the situation, right? This is quite an exciting chicken race. The prize is one of the few major investment banks on the lunar surface, with total assets worth 24 billion moles. If this fails, everyone will end up drowning at sea. People sometimes call me a madman, but how wrong they are. I am certainly not alone in that. He must have been having so much fun. Like a child, because he's a diehard short seller, he must have really loved seeing the chaos in the market and companies. Still, taking advantage of the panicked offer about is quite common practice. E.J. Rochebert is not to blame here. The problem is how extremely dangerous the situation is. Bull stairs is in such a state. Yes, I only give it a rough look. But if we leave things be, it will certainly collapse. Resolving the trust issue is going to be extremely difficult. Besides, based on my own experience, when such a financial pipe collapses, a different kind of chaos occurs compared to when a company from the business world such as Avalon collapses. I nodded. For companies to make cars and furniture, there is no such thing anywhere in the world as a lender of last resort. Indeed, only banks have a direct pipe to the government, the central bank. Earth has learned from experience that this is the only place that you can never crush on a whim. That even if you want to crush it, you have to do so in an orderly fashion. Especially right now, in a situation where investors everywhere are trying to pull out their capital as hard cash. When 100 billion moles worth of ABS and CDO have been confirmed as sold. On top of that, there is the protection working as a two-stage bomb. Straw has been piled up everywhere possible as fuel, and the whole place reeks of gasoline. Right now, everyone is observing the situation, holding their breath in fear of which financial institution is going to blame up that blow up next. Now, try to imagine the fire reaching that place. We will see hell itself. I found myself wishing Wallace had laughed when he said that, but Wallace was not even grinning as he ushered me into a large meeting room. Inside around a large round table, several people are already buried in a mountain of documents and storage media. As Margo noticed me, he pointed me to the seat next to his. Well, it's been a while since I last did that kind of work. Thankfully, the guys with the neckties will handle the buyout negotiations. That's the most annoying part. We, on the other hand, shall take this opportunity to rummage through the raw data, shan't we? If they ever made this into a movie, I could just imagine them showing Dr. Wallace pulling on a pair of rubber gloves with a snap. The initial negotiations for the buyout start after the market had closed for the day. Though E.J. Roachberg might not have finished the valuation of assets for bull stairs, it was clear that if one of their buyers were to disappear, they would lose everything. In any case, we would probably need to make a rough estimate for the time being. Really, though, I felt at home in a situation where there was too much to do and not enough time. If I'd had plenty of time to take care of those tasks, or even if I'd been able to postpone them, I would have ended up doing nothing but brooding over Hagana. I'd rather not think about whether that'd be a productive thing to do or not. For that reason, I continued working in a daze. 
As expected, bull stairs being a crucial part of the money market, their assets were being particular their assets were particularly varied. Evaluating the worth of their positions in financial derivative products was particularly complicated. For example, let's say they made a one-year agreement to obtain these derivatives from other companies with a floating interest rate which moved up and down along with the stock market, instead of a fixed interest rate. In simpler terms, that would be a classical interest swap. Now let's move forward one month after that agreement was made. What would be that contract's value at that point in time? How would you know so early on? The only way to know for sure was to wait for that transaction to be concluded and check the difference between money paid and money received in order to find out whether the transaction had turned a profit or a loss. Apparently, there were over 200,000 of these tedious transactions among Bullster's assets. Regardless of how many there were, it was still necessary to put a price on these products with an uncertain current value. As for things like shares, bonds, and other similar options, since they were frequently traded back and forth in the stock market, it was easy to determine their price. The problem was that since most financial derivatives were made to order, they were rarely traded. So basically, this meant that in order to assess their value, they had to arbitrarily put a price on the products themselves. Most investment banks had their own value models for that purpose. These were the usual stuff based on mathematics, which estimated their future price range. Bolsters had submitted theirs, and the people knew who what to make. People who knew what to make of them were steadily crunching numbers by hand in order to put out their overall value. As he cast sidelong glances at the process, Marco said in a small voice, "The main issue is most definitely going to be the dispute over the appraisal of these assets, huh?" Yeah, even though only a god could judge that. It's an ancient earth saying that he who has the money controls the universe, you know. Yeah. Kind of like those kids who say their dad rules the world when they can't answer. I doubt a kid can understand what being a claims trader means. Are you saying that you can? Marco shrugged at my question. If you deign me to recognize, if you deign to recognize me as an adult, I'll let you know. Maybe he was still upset about me letting him manage the office while I was on Earth. I then realized a couple of minutes later that wasn't it. Despite my unsightly defeat against Barton, he had still considered me an adult worthy of his respect. When Marco noticed I was looking at him, he raised his head with a questioning look. There was only one thing I could say. By the way, I've given it a lot of thought, but honestly, I don't know what it means either. Marco replied smiling a little. I think anyone who knows what it means wouldn't be doing that work. Fair enough. Despite the conversation we were having, the workload we shared between Wallace, Maria, and the two of us was clearly the heaviest among everyone. It seemed that most of the people here were either young bureaucrats from the economy department, or lawyers and accountants brought in by Sasha's office. Even if they knew the theory, it seemed they didn't actually know much about the stock market. As such, we spontaneously found ourselves dealing with old-fashioned data for the valuation of assets, since we were part of the wooden leg donkeys. That data included things like the value of the old-time commissions earned by the sales department by calling clients to sell them shares on the phone. That aside, we also had tons of real estate properties to assess. Contrary to the rest of the lunar surface or even Earth, we were the one small field that could see the madness going on all around us. Since I was no specialist, I couldn't make precise assessments, but I could still make a rough estimate of the depreciation rate using the interest rate, the increase rate, and the rent prices. After that, I only needed to give figures everyone else agreed with. This might seem sloppy, but after all, nobody could tell what would happen in the future. People couldn't even predict how prices would evolve today on the stock market by the time it would close. We could only strive to at least make a raw estimate of the current prices. But still, thanks to doing all that, I managed to get a solid understanding of Bullstair's recklessness. They must have had lots of fun buying all these loans and selling them on securities. Just the thought of them enjoying champagne-soaked days of revelry as they raked in profits made one glare at them. But now they had basically become the root of all evil. Of course, E.J. Rochberg was definitely going to sink its teeth into them, pointing to them as the origin of everything. It had taken less than a month for their champagne-filled days to turn into a nightmarish hangover. As I thought about how the world of investing really was unpredictable, something suddenly hit my shoulder. Out of reflex, I looked at the time, only to see that it was a little before the closing of the stock market at 5.30pm. That meant that I had been working for roughly six hours straight. When I turned around, I was faced with a young female accountant holding documents and wearing an embarrassed expression.
The timid looking girl who reminded me of Chris nervously started talking. Excuse me, about that protection contract for Schweitzer Investment. I reflexively glanced at Margo, thinking that this might be bad news, but her following words were somewhat something unexpected. Are those figures incorrect? Huh? They're correct, at least as far as I know. Why? I was wondering how so many insurance policies have been sold for that kind of money. Yeah, we've had that discussion amongst us in our office, too. We were wondering about why the protections for these risky products would go for so cheap. And because of that, you bought them? Like I said, they were cheap. My reply left her with mouth wide open in bewilderment, before she nodded like a puppet whose, springs had been, whose strings had been cut. Two million moles worth of protection bought with a 0.82% interest rate. And if the protective securities were to go bankrupt, I would receive 200 million moles. The payment would be carried out as stated in the contract. However, from an outsider's perspective, the bet probably seemed incomprehensible, as did the interest rates and the amount of money. And then the accumulation of all these incomprehensible things had led to this situation. What happened? Well, I was wondering if it wouldn't be better to go help over there. But is that because of that? Marco followed my line of sight and looked at where that girl was sitting before hesitantly saying, Are you saying that because she looks like Chris? I laughed unintentionally. It was a good thing Marco was on my side, I thought. That's not it. Well, maybe a little. Then why are you saying that? I realize that even if they sent us the data about the underlying assets of the securities, they aren't asking for an estimation of the securities. How are they planning to calculate something with unknown origins? Well, they're going to use value models like they did with the derivatives and... Wait, huh? It seemed that Marco had realized what he was saying was odd. Did the others notice that? They were using the ones made by Bull Stairs, right? But that's... They have been proven to be basically useless, huh? After all, they have lost a bet that they insisted was perfectly safe thanks to their tools. What's the doctor's opinion on the matter? When I turned to look at him, I saw that his seat was vacant. I wasn't sure how long this had been the case, but he was sick after all. Still, I needed someone else's opinion about that. Right as I thought that, a bell suddenly rang loudly. It's time. As we covered her ears against the noise, Sasha made her entrance along with some of her subordinates. Alright, please gather up what you've done. I'm going to make a draft proposal for negotiations after summing them up and correcting them. Here, here, and here. Quickly, everybody started collecting memo pads and the like, and our own things were no exception. The only difference in treatment between the different groups of people present here was whether Sasha winked at them or not. I was so worried about how much the market value was now that I didn't even feel like checking. So basically, that will be all for now. Go grab a bite and make sure to replenish your energy for the next round of analyses. With that, Sasha's group left and the atmosphere suddenly grew heavy. Marco took out his tablet with vigor and checked the stock prices. Yesterday, Bullstairs closing price diminished by 50%, thus reaching their limit down at 28 moles. Wow. Seems that the stock market is aware of their dire predicament. It's definitely going to keep declining tomorrow as well. This is really going to be trouble, some. During the first quarter of the year, their net worth was around 30 moles per share. Since shares basically represented the ownership of a company, if a company were to issue 100 shares, that meant by buying one, you would own 1% of that company's assets. As such, it was possible to estimate the value of their assets using the net worth of one of their shares. So 30 moles. How... how much do you think it will be? I'm not sure how the value of their assets will vary, but with the way things are going, I'd say 14.5 would be a fair estimation. Half of its book value? That's harsh. From now on, the protection and the slump of real estate are surely going to affect the market, so it's going to damage people's trust. On top of that, a fair number of clients have left, so earnings for commissions will probably decrease as well. But I still think that a reduction of their shares value by half is too steep if they manage to stay in the black. With their book value reduced by half, that was the equivalent of being able to buy a hundred million a hundred mole bill for only fifty moles. However, things weren't as straightforward in life. Let's imagine a cardboard box filled with ten thousand hundred mole bills. If you weighed the box, you could see that there were indeed ten thousand hundred mole bills in it. 
but at the bottom of the box was sopping wet to the point of dripping, and a burning smell was coming from the top. Since its lid was closed, it was impossible to check its contents. Now then, how much money would you get from that box? That was basically what this example was about. That's still better than going bankrupt, isn't it? I guess so. Leaving that aside, should we go get something to eat? Huh? What, you're not hungry? Apparently surprised by my question, Marco mumbled something. As I tilted my head in confusion, Marco shrugged at me as he replied. It's not that. I just thought that was surprising coming from you. What was? I gave some thought before laughing bitterly when I realized what he was talking about. You mean the whole unrequited love thing? I thought you'd be more the type to overthink it. Well, I can't really deny that. As I walked out, Marco obediently followed me. He stayed silent for a bit before walking faster to catch up to me and ask. So how did it go? Nothing happened. That's not me trying to dodge the topic. As we came out of the government building, we head for Clapton Square. I've given all my accounts to Barton. I got a card key in exchange. His contract with Akana has been terminated as per our agreement. Then what? After that, I briefly talked to Hagana. Marco kept staring at my face. It seemed that, just like Eleanor, he had no intention of letting me avoid the topic. While it was probably out of concern, it'd be a bold-faced lie if he were to say he had no interest in this. If nothing else, I was put at ease about a few things. Then... It's merely the relief of not having had any insults, invectives, or curses thrown at me, though. It was just as if she no longer had any interest in me, like she might have hated and resented me before, but it's all in the past now. That kind of feeling. If nothing else, it didn't seem like she was doing all that to take revenge on me by snatching away all my money. That part wasn't done on purpose, and somehow... Even though Marco was younger than me, I spoke to him as though he were my age. That's kind of a relief for me. Isn't that stupid? I have paid 10 billion moles for that. Even though I laughed when I said that, I also felt a bit like crying. My pride as his boss is probably the only thing keeping that from happening. It's something important to you. Marco said that kindly. We put, walked past the train station and went to the curry restaurant in Clapton Square. Not only was it informal and tasty, but the spicy food would help me wake up. I finally understood why Sir and Chris liked that place. Still, I wonder what he's planning to do with so much money. So this is the exact same thing we saw earlier. <laughs> Marco casually said that as he ate his curry. Naturally, he was curious about that. He said he wanted to take down Emerald Industries. Marco's hand stopped. Surprising, right? Yes, but isn't Barton pretty wealthy himself? Well, I'd say so. Why do you ask? Because even with all the money we've won, we wouldn't be able to buy Emerald Industries. That's what EI is supposed to be. Those words caught me unawares, but he was right. Our victory should have awarded us nearly 40 billion in theory. However, the aggregate market value for EI was one figure higher, reaching over 200 billion moles. People in possession of shares from that company and its affiliates would definitely not let go of them so easily. A hostile takeover would most likely fail. What was he planning to do? I then remembered what Hagana had said. Even though her goals were the same as Barton's, she had no interest in Emerald Industries. What the hell did that mean? As I was pondering this while eating my curry, I received an email on my tablet. It was from Risa wondering if Hagana at least ate properly. I then suddenly realized that Risa was still worrying about Hagana. I hastily sent her a reply. Hagana is room 5002 at the Royal Central Hotel. You probably want to drop by. If so, I'll give you the card key. After a slight hesitation, I finally added as a postscript. I wish I could go with you, but I have extremely urgent work to take care of. It's a request from the government. After I sent that re message, a reply arrived soon. Did something happen? In any case, got it. I'll try to go. What name is she going by? Anna Hag. 
I can imagine Risa half laughing at my reply. Well, you know. Hmm? It would be nice if we could come to an agreement smoothly for both stairs. I hope so too. If not, it's going to be troublesome. As I finished up my curry, I left my seat along with Marco, who was already done. I had some things I wanted to discuss with Wallace regarding the valuation of Bull's assets. However, when we came back to the meeting room, all the people there were restless. They were staying around talking. Not a single one of them was working. Marco and I exchanged glances, and when we asked about Wallace's whereabouts, we were pointed to Gazanika's office. When we headed there, the secretary told us they were waiting for us, and we were let into the office. Gazanika, Wallace, and Sasha were inside. They all looked sullen. Did something happen? Wallace answered my question. People's greed knows no bounds. Are you talking about the negotiations? It hadn't even been open for an hour yet, but if Sasha, who was supposed to take in these negotiations, was not there, that meant that the initial negotiation had fallen through. They had probably failed to reach an agreement. How much did the other party offer? Bullstairs wants 20 moles per unit, and they're offering four. Thinking I had heard wrong, I stared at Wallace. Offering four moles per share is the same as saying that Bullstairs' aggregate market value is worth that price. There's no way the shareholders will accept this. The people from Bullsey have brought back papers for that offer just in case. But they definitely can't show that to their shareholders. I wish I had been the one to tell E.J. Roachberg to take their offer and leave. Even in the information available to the public, they are pretty steady, and here I was thinking that 15 moles or so would constitute a sensible discount. Even with a rough evaluation made in under 20 hours, the overall conclusion is the same, but there are still lots of assets to appraise, which was another source of disagreement. It seems that on their end, E.J. Roseberg has basically considered that the 30 billion moles worth of positions in risky assets like securities and real estate were basically worth nothing. <sighs> I gulped. Walsh and I were both aware that it was difficult to point out how unreasonable that was. After all, we had strived to get our hands on as much protection as possible, thinking that the real estate market was going to collapse. Expecting its collapse all at the same time hoping that the consequences would be too catastrophic wasn't coherent. I might have been feeling sympathetic towards Bull Stairs, which was about to suffocate because of a bank run, something basically akin to an accident. I shook my head and said something that had been worrying me. Out of curiosity, how much has Bull evaluated their own assets at? I've been thinking about that since earlier. Aren't they using the mathematical tools which basically failed at doing their calculations? Sasha shrugged with her arms crossed. The one to answer me was Wallace, who was absentmindedly looking somewhere else. They're doing their evaluation, basically using their cost bases. Their cost bases? Then are their paper losses almost null? Is their situation that critical? They're claiming that statistical data about the real estate bankruptcy should be judged in the long run. I see what they're trying to do, but... If they were to include the temporary loan bankruptcies in the use range for their statistical data, their bankruptcy rate would skyrocket. Their value models would probably end up including the results of a tremendous price decline. In that case, even if they took the recent bankruptcies into account, since they have solid data from before, wouldn't that raise the probability of a generalized bankruptcy quite a bit in their statistics? It's one of their arguments. I definitely saw what they were trying to do. However, I can only see that as them trying to look away from reality. After all, having the world change so violently from one day to the next was normal in the world of the stock market. Even if I thought that, I realized that I would have been hard-pressed to give a reply had I been asked about the scale of their bankruptcy. Should I consider that the current bankruptcy rate would be rising from now on, and thus it would be it would keep doing so at a constant pace? Or should I believe that things would settle down and their rate would go back down? But when would that happen? What would be the optimal scale estimate? Who in the world could know that sort of thing? They all believed that they could predict the future with these incomprehensible mathematical formulas. And because they've planned everything in accordance with these predictions, when reality rears its ugly head and makes these predictions useless, all they can do is run around blindly in confusion. Although it seems we were right when we decided to bet on that vulnerability. 
So basically, the buyer has a reason to act with the assumption that all the risky assets are going to bankrupt, are going to go bankrupt. Is that what you mean? Exactly. E.J. Rocheberg also has a duty towards its shareholders to protect the value of their own funds when it makes a purchase. Be it from an emotional or a pragmatic point of view, Bolster is probably going to accept being bought in its entirety for the same price as the building where its headquarters was located. I can imagine its shareholders preferring to just let the company sink rather than lower themselves to do that. If the offer was too low, it would be more profitable for them to just get the money from the liquidation of the company anyway. As for E.J. Roachberg, the more they paid, the higher the possibility of registering losses was. Aim could see that it was reckless of Bolsters to try to get E.J. Roachberg, the only company willing to buy them, to pay the price they were asking for was basically a rotting apple. We won't intervene as long as you don't accept. The obvious fact that they're going to lose money over this. If they were told that, they would definitely protest. The only thing we can do is bring up the possibility of the lunar surface's economy collapsing, but that was also harsh. After all, if Bull Stairs was bought at an unfairly high price, the stock market would start worrying about a downturn, which would cause E.J. Rocheberg itself to waver, thus making the current issue even worse than it already was. Also, there was a precedent for companies who had spent too much money buying out pricey companies, only to end up throwing themselves up undigested and collapsing from exhaustion. Then, aren't we at a stalemate? When I said that, Sasha's gaze shifted towards Gazanika. Gazanika was sitting on his desk, scratching his head in apparent disarray. Seeing him so perplexed, I vaguely wondered if that was what they meant by the expression working oneself to the bone. No, there might be a way to have a breakthrough. What is it? Gazanika looked at me. You. Me. I asked that before the realization hit me. Was he going to ask me to cough up the money I had earned with my predictions? However, I had already given that money to Barton. I thought about that before remembering that Sasha was there. She wouldn't know that this option didn't exist. Then what could it be? Was I going to be sent to the negotiation table? But I wasn't specialized in M&A. Merger and acquisition. When companies merge and or purchased... Gazanika looked at me with a pained expression and said, Chris is part of the group in charge of the valuation of assets for E.J. Roachberg. In the first place, she was in charge of the value model, which has become problematic. Actually, wasn't she one of the early stage developers who created these famous securities before she was promoted? I met her quite often after Avalon was brought down, but she has become quite outstanding. For some reason, it felt kind of as if I was her uncle in a way. It's odd. Gazanika laughed bitterly, then he regained his serious expression and continued. I've heard that you two are quite close. Even if she's not the one who will decide the price of the buyout, she will definitely play an important part. Now that I've said that much, I'm sure you realize why there aren't any representatives from both stairs here, don't you? He was right. Only Gazanika, Sasha, and Wallace were here. That way, whatever was discussed here would not get leaked. So basically, it was for that sole purpose. You want me to negotiate with Chris to get a more favorable evaluation? Yes, basically. No way. A transaction always ought to be fair. Profits were supposed to be the return for the risks taken. After all, Bullstairs finding itself in a tight corner was them reaping what they had sown, so to speak. However, that had nothing to do with this. I was clueless when it came to mathematics. So they wanted me to ask her for tolerant treatment on the sole basis that we were close. Was that the right thing to do as an investor? I'm aware that asking you to do this is particularly disrespectful. Gazanika said that gravely. However, Bullstairs' capital outflow is speeding up, it seems. It's up to the point that they're no longer sure whether they'll be able to last for 48 more hours. That means they won't even hold on to the end of this week. Yes. As the president of the lunar surface, I have the obligation to make the best decisions to ensure its safety. I can't let bull stairs go bankrupt. Billions of moles would stop circulating. Of course, I intend to find a fair compromise together with bull stairs. However, if it goes awry, I'll have to resort to unauthorized means. I need someone to tell them that an offer of four moles per share will only spur the collapse of the lunar surface, 
and I want you to be that person. Kazunika concluded his answer with his trademark eloquence. So all in all, I had been chosen to advocate for the sake of society because I was the most capable of influencing Chris. I thought to myself this was basically the same strategy I'd used on Marco when I started the investments towards protections. But I guess it was true. What goes around comes around. My parents call this karma. However, I didn't have the option of refusing. Since I knew that, I couldn't pretend I didn't. With that, I also understood why Wallace had fixedly remained silent. That's because even this could end up generating profits for us. Understood. You're going to do it? As I endured Kazunika's intense handshake, I looked at Wallace who seemed to be blaming himself. Lots of financial institutions have begun holding back the payments of the protection, starting with both stairs. Since the market state was probably going to deteriorate even further, that meant that more and more money was going to fall in his pocket. However, if those paying him were to go bankrupt, he would lose everything. Thus, he had a reason for wanting to help them by any means possible. Besides, if E.J. Ruchberg made some changes to its value models, it would probably help other financial institutions. Huh. Wallace spat this out of my question. The announcements on the financial results are just around the corner. However, given the current market situation, companies are terrified of becoming the next bull stairs if they announce bad results. At least, if they could at least have some margin of error, they would gladly take it. If E.J. Roachberg bought bull stairs for a high price, that would theoretically mean that value models had higher values than in reality. On top of that, it would make the government a legitimate concil conciliator. So, and other companies would probably see that as an opportunity to make higher estimations of their value of their own assets. Of course, should it return to a reasonable price once the stock market calms down? But for now, things are going too fast. Rather than being broad-minded, Gazanik was being awfully pragmatic as he said that with a pained expression. That was definitely not a pretty situation. It was something hard to accept for Wallace, who had made tremendous amounts of money by exposing companies who manipulated their balance sheets or tried to hide their wrongdoings. As for Sasha, who lived in the world of law, that topic was definitely not a funny one. As for me, I had come all the way here after defeating Avalon. When it came to the stock market, I always wanted to do things with integrity. However, if we left it to the market me mechanism, the buyout would end in failure. Bull stairs would be sentenced to bankruptcy market would probably fall into chaos. If only there was more time, things could somehow sort themselves out. However, Bull Stairs suddenly had suffered a heart attack. There was no time. And I understand. And just like that, I had crossed the Rubicon. So when should I start the negotiations with Chris? Kazunika and Sasha let out a small sigh of relief, and Kazunika replied, the sooner, the better. Got it. I only gave that short answer. I called Chris on her personal line. She picked up on the fourth ring. Is that you, Chris? Who beside me would answer? She had a brighter dispos disposition than I expected. But from the words that followed, it was clear that she knew that this was not going to be a social call. You were faster than I expected. I'm sure you are aware of why. I learned about Bolster's distress from someone at the Interbank Market. Do you know about it? By name, yes. It's a place where big financial institutions lend each other operating funds, right? It's a place that deals with borrowing and lending special funds for one day in the hundreds of million in the hundreds or in the hundreds of millions or billions of moles, sometimes without collateral. It seems they still haven't gotten around to using an internet connection. They do all their deals by phone. The people in, ch in charge deal over the phone, and the names of people wanting to borrow or lend go on a whiteboard. That's what I've heard, at least. And then contracts are made by processing companies whose conditions match, and they erase the names. What do you mean? Chris answered my question softly. Bolster's name was written there first thing in the morning, and it stayed there for the whole day from what I heard. They can't even get into a one-day debt. But the really cruel thing is, once one ends up in the situation, it will only get worse, and no one will even want to talk.
talk to you. Seems the countdown has started. Bolster's funds keep on leaking without any income. The account they use for payment processing is at EJ Rochberg, that is to say, our company. This is quite obvious, but even investment banks have to open an account somewhere to put their profits in their business funds, and they have to let someone handle the daily payment operations such as paychecks and expenses. Even if it is a service provided by a business rival, this would be... This world is so small that if you don't use such a service, you won't be able to do business. Besides, I can understand why E.J. Roachberg announced their intention to buy out Bull Stairs. It was probably because from the initial stages of the whole chaos, they had understood that Bull Stairs' problems stem from a crisis of liquidity. This makes things easier, then. Can't we meet somewhere? This was not the sort of persuasion that could be done via a strong base and logical reasoning alone. It needed to be done face to face. But Chris's response to my request was unexpected. I don't mind, but may I choose the place? Do you have a cafe you prefer? At Reese's Church. I was caught off guard by her words. We won't be interrupted there, and you won't be able to lie there, right? I felt like I'd said the same thing to Chris before. I sighed a bit before answering. Understood. Let's do this there. I can be there in two hours. With that, the call ended. The church. I began to suspect she was testing my conscience. I hesitated over contacting Risa, but in the end I went to the church without calling her. If she was at the church, then everything was fine. If she was talking to Hagana, I didn't want to bother them. I knew where she had a spare key, so there was no problem. As this thought crossed my mind, I noticed that light was shining in the hallway and that the door was already unlocked. Opening the door, I could see the living room, beyond the silent hallway where only light shone through. Chris? I called out to her but got no answer. Since the door leading to the church proper was half opened, I decided to go there and notice that light was shining through the window. As I opened the door, I found Chris there. Good evening. Chris was sitting in a pew. She sounded relaxed. She wasn't in a competitive mood, relaxed to the extent that it looked like she was convinced there was no room for discussion, that's why she was so at ease. You came quickly. Yes, I took the company car. I found myself looking around the church before speaking. Would it be advisable to look for any hidden microphones? I would never do such a thing. Chris said that, puffing out her cheeks deliberately. But as she exhaled, she gave an embarrassed smile. But I have been warned a few times about this. Still, my words are merely those of an outsider, you know. No, I meant that they use microphones to record my words, and the warning would be against you trying to take a commitment from me. I looked at Chris. It was obvious, but me calling Chris out like this meant forcing her to deal with pressure from her company. Sorry. No, it's nothing. Chris replied with a smile. I heaved a small sigh before sitting in another pew, lined up with Chris's but at a distance. This is when I noticed that Chris had a small paper bag next to her. What's that? Do you want to know? When she said that in a mischievous tone, I felt embarrassed, but Chris chuckled before revealing the contents of the bag. There. Your share. Chris pulled a small bottle of beer from the paper bag. So, you'd have trouble speaking sober. I thought you would, so... She was on to me. Chris looked amused as she opened her bottle with an opener and she took from the bag. Then she threw the opener my way. As I opened my own bottle, the thought crossed my mind that she was taking the lead. So can we actually see the labels on these? Can't really tell anything there. You want to talk about the price, right? If you have something better to talk about, that's fine, too. Chris gulped down her beer, and then she let out a slight burp. Seeing her hold the bottle with a vacant look in her eyes, it looked like she was drinking a, a soft drink than alcohol. However, the person sitting here was undoubtedly a very talented woman, 
one who had reached an unprecedented position in the most powerful bank on the lunar surface, E.J. Rochberg. Just so you know, I don't have decisive authority to settle on the price. Of course, I understand that. But... Chris drank one sip of beer, closing her eyes as she was trying to listen carefully to music before letting a smile slip onto her lips and speaking. I was the one who said four moles. Are you using the typical technique they use in souks? I don't actually know what this is. A negotiation technique where you give a price that's clearly too high or too low, and where you bring it closer and closer to the price you want. Okay. It's a technique you often see in movies and souks. That is, markets where colorful vegetables are lined up in street stalls. Well, there's a bit of that, but... So your true motive lies elsewhere. Yes. Chris answered looking at me. And I will say this is someone who trusts you, you know? She had the eyes of a cool-headed trader, one who can bring forth profits from figures dancing on her screen like magic. We're going to take over E.J. Roachberg. Huh. I thought I heard her wrong. E.J. Roachberg would buy a bull stairs, or did Chris quit E.J. Roachberg at some point and switch over to bull stairs? Chris chuckled as she looked at my dumbfounded expression. Then she heaved a sigh and turned her gaze toward the inner part of the church. Take over E.J. Roachberg with our team. As Chris's gaze turned away from the altar and back to me, she looked cheeky, provocative, and completely innocent. A central figure of the lunar surface called the Big Boss, the legendary banker who built the most powerful bank in one generation, E.J. Roachberg. Do you know where he is and his cronies are right now? From the way she asked, I could hazard a guess. The Orville Elevator. Correct. After all, he is quite old. Right after the medical report got out, he left the lunar surface. And right now, a lot of top executives are using this excuse to run away. After all, if they stayed on the lunar surface, they might be forced to take responsibility for this whole state of chaos that started with the collapse of the real estate market. This is why more and more people are fleeing. That's the same reason Bullsteer's VP came out in the open. She was right. At a critical moment where his own company might collapse or be bought out, the CEO didn't show his face. It was physically impossible for him to show himself, and that was probably because he fled the lunar surface when the medical report came out. The people who stayed here are the ones who have a lot of unfinished business on the lunar surface, as well as people who think there is value in leading their lives here. What about you? Chris shrugged at my question, then she laughed as though embarrassed. Do you think I could make, my, make such a career for myself anywhere else? She even said pompously that her branch would assuredly be the most profitable in the world. I guess at this point in time, these words were perfectly true. Besides, I completely changed policies just before the market turned around, even against the strong opposition I faced. Right. You said you had reevaluated your positions. It was terrible. Having to leave the ones who bring in profit and switch to the opposite direction. So, the other party who slipped in the very last chance was... So that huge purchaser was yours, Hal, right? Everyone's eyes popped right out of their heads when they saw that, as you might guess. They were wondering if you were crazy, but it was so cool. Even though we'd been quite generous, going out of our way with a 20% increase, someone rescued you away from us just like that with 30%. And you didn't just stop there. After that, you literally bought up everything available with an unbelievable amount of money, right? Do you have any idea how hard it was to gather the remaining scraps? There was no one in the way, that's all. Lies. We heard of New Age... De uh, development's bankruptcy through the bulletins, but you knew about it before that, and you made your last bet. Did you walk out there to see it for yourself? I went to the other side of the moon for Avalon. This was nothing. Hearing my words, Chris smiled happily. If I looked sullen, it was because Chris was looking at me as if I was the object of her admiration or something. But at any rate, I... No, my team and I really prevented E.J. Roachberg from hitting an iceberg by a hair's breadth day we saw that shower of light. It was the day we did everything we could to sell all our toxic assets no matter how cheap the price. Then we could finally take a breather. You managed to sell them. Well, the market was still in high spirits at that time. People even thanked us, 
But the reason we got away with that was because we'd already made enough profits to strike anyone silly. No department within the bank could oppose what we said. Figures. In this world, whoever had the money made the rules. And, now that you've given E.J. Rochberg huge profits twice, what will you be up to? When working in stock trading, sometimes you come across success that seemed to be the work of God. At first, you'd think that you were just lucky. But as time went on, you'd start to believe it was due to your own abilities. In the end, even the most cool-headed person could end up thinking that. That they alone must have some divine power that allowed them to see through everything. Chris, who was softly chuckling at me, still retained some of her cuteness from four years ago. But there was something in that face reminiscent of a ruler of a universe looking down on everyone. I'm thinking about asking that the old guard kindly take their leave. She discovered the core concept of the Holy Grail and had brilliant success refining it into a product, and then into a very attractive amount of gold that attracted not only investors on lunar surface, but from the whole world. Without a doubt, this alone could be considered a success worthy of telling her grandchildren about. Not to mention she probably earned herself a large enough reward to, to let herself kick back and relax until those grandchildren come along. Plus, along the way, she even stopped the ABS engine while it was running at full power, and she managed to make it run in reverse to avoid running to her death. All that in the span of a few days, where the market turned over. She evaded the iceberg ahead of her, just barely scraping her nose on it. Truly a godlike display of evasive maneuvers. I could only hazard a guess as to how great the maelstrom of excitement was that must have swallowed E.J. Rochberg's employees. This must have boosted Chris's confidence and that must have given them an unthinkable sense of omnipotence. We could control the world. We are the only ones worthy of controlling the world. A coup d'etat, huh? And the first step was absorbing both stairs, then. Yes, while the boss is gone, we proceed with this buyout that could be justified by a request from the government. And now we will build a gigantic financial supermarket with our own hands. We create ABS, but if we had had both stairs and their gigantic security sales unit inside our company, we could have sold more of them, you know. This will make it much easier for us to do so. We will change the world into one that the E.J. Rochberg boss won't be able to understand. You look like a real monster of capitalism, you know. Well then, why don't we call the new company Leviathan or something? Was it a delusion born from intoxicating success? She might be right, though. However, precisely because the huge players like E.J. Rochberg have been plotting to protect their success at all costs, they've committed a major fault in not being present at a time of major change. If worse came to worst, it was possible that everything would be decided while they were in the elevator and unreachable. After all, Bolstair CEO should become aware of everything after it was all decided. Whether the buyout proceeded smoothly, or whether it failed and they announced their bankruptcy, by the time they discovered it, his former home would have already changed beyond recognition, and he would most likely not have a place there anymore. Chaos threatens order, and the lack of order becomes the butt of a new order. Chris silently took one more sip of beer and spoke in a girlish tone. Four moles. Period. I don't understand why you said period here. Chris raised her head and put on a sweet smile. There is no need to make you understand who has the lead. The only buyer for bull stairs. As everyone was scrambling about, trying to avoid the collapse of bull stairs at all costs, they were the only ones who actually had the power to take them in. As such, it was very obvious who the game maker was, and everyone knew it. However, understanding your mind and understanding your bones were two very different things. I understood this very thing now, in my bones. Four moles. At that price, we will buy. And it's not the starting point for negotiations. Four moles. Chris repeated her words once more. Are you aware that at that price, it would be the same as their HQ building? On dangerous positions worth beyond 30 billion moles that currently hold hundreds of thousands of financial derivatives products that can't be evaluated, it's not like this number is completely unfounded. Besides, there would also be a huge payment awaiting you. Besides, Hal, you would never, ever say that Bullstair's positions are sane and sound, right? Exactly. 
Convince that everything would outright collapse, and precisely on this position in which I had bent, I came to tell her to evaluate them loosely. So Chris brought booze with her as a sympathetic move. No matter how you look at it, what I came here to do was clearly insane. If the bio doesn't go smoothly, the lunar surface will collapse, you know. At my words, the smile disappeared from Chris's face for the first time. And just as she was about to drink one more sip, she slowly moved the beer away from her mouth. No way. That would never happen. It will all go smoothly. How are you able to say that? Because everyone thinks that the lunar surface is going to collapse like that. Chris smiled, her mouth forming an ominous crescent shape. I shuddered, staring back at Chris. As soon as they started looking for someone to sell themselves out to, the result was already decided. The problem is not the price. In principle, rather than selling the company for formals, liquidating the company just like that might allow the shareholders to recover more money. However, this hinges on the hypothesis that after the bankruptcy, the com economy will still be stable. If it collapsed, all the assets would disappear along with the company. With the situation as it stands, this deal is already settled from the very beginning. In order to gain what money they can, hell, they have to sell whatever the price. Chris said that with a sad smile on her face. Did you forget why something like ABS sold? Everyone wanted the certainty he provides. Everything is uncertain, vague, full of risks. So even if it's a lie, they wanted reassurance. Four moles, period. Really, I'd like you to congratulate me for not saying one mole. Chris said these words as she started folding the paper bag neatly. I could do nothing but stare at her. It was like a metaphor for the conversation being at an end, folded up for good. But as she currently was, I had to tell her this. Did you forget why, four years ago, I was able to outweigh your program? People don't act according to math. There's always. Logicality, emotions, I know that. Now, having finished folding the paper bag, she was shaking the beer bottle slightly, making an annoyed sloshing sound. But what I'm saying is that our rationality will win. Now, Chris stood up and, looking down at me, said those words. I have faith that it will win. This is how deals work. No one can say for certain whether it'll all go smoothly, after all. Won't you even think about raising the probability of winning? If you express concern for the other party, you might even get concessions out of them. By raising from four moles to eight moles? If I was going to do that, I would keep my mouth shut and wait until the last minute, the last second, before announcing the bankruptcy. Extending the hand of salvation right after that would be so much more effective, after all. So if there was a mistake to point out what we did, it was that we raised our hand too quickly. With time to think over things, everyone would think about making a little more profit. Even though it's obvious to everyone that bolsters can't get out of this run on their own, it's so weird. I... I hate this way of thinking. This is a deal. Why can't you be more rational? I mean, is there something wrong with being rational? Chris. I couldn't keep myself from whispering her name. Here she was. The woman who had followed through capitalism to its logical limit, or at least mastered, mastered rationalism to the extreme, and she was scorning and sneering at people lost in their emotions. I had no words that could convince Chris. Maybe Risa could. The thought crossed my mind, but Chris would only be wounded by Risa's persuasion, and she would probably not change her mind. This was because I could not agree with what Chris was thinking. I wouldn't use methods that trample on other people's thoughts, but it certainly wasn't because I cared for the other person. It was because I was convinced it was more efficient to use people without trampling upon them. Chris closed her eyes, took a slow breath, and exhaled. She gazed at the altar for a while, chuckling as if she was laughing at herself before lowering her gaze. If the lunar surface collapses, I'm sorry. If you're going to apologize, but I won't budge from four moles. Chris raised her face, looking at me. She had something like an embarrassed smile on her face. Just like what I had seen four years ago. A smile, and at the same time, tears. Because I... In the back of my mind, I recalled what she said four years ago. Want to live however I want to. 
I couldn't tell whether I spoke those words or whether Chris did. Chris looked at me with a grin, but th that was all. That was all it took for Chris to stop crying, as if she had overcome her doubts. She raised her glasses, wiping her face with one hand, and the tears stopped flowing. She sniffed, took a deep breath, and picked up her tablet to call someone. It's over. Please send a car. And she ended the call. Chris wiped the corners of her eyes once more before walking out. I could only follow her with my eyes as she left. Without turning back even once, Chris reached out to the door of the church. I had the impression that if she left this place, she would never, ever come back. No, that was probably her intention. That was precisely her reason for picking this place to ask for my advice. Chris must have thrown at, at me all the words she'd been hiding deep in her heart. Words she couldn't say even within E.J. Roachberg. Without a shred of deception, hesitation, or even shame or guilt. Because... Because Chris still had a thing for me. Chris. I called out her name. Chris stopped moving, startled. Then just like that, she opened the door and was about to leave. But she was about to cross to the hallway. She turned back to look at me. She was smiling. Let's meet again somewhere, okay? Chris said this in a relaxed tone. Then she turned her back to me. I shall walk my own path by completely cutting off her lingering affection for me. With that, Chris left abruptly. It was all over so suddenly. Now at this very instant, Chris's success was the success of her comrades, and her comrades' praise was the only praise she would receive. Eight years ago, because I was nearly a cripple, Chris had come to my house timidly at a word from Risa, and for four years, she had been by my side and helped with my rehabilitation. It was a really short time, but I also did the one thing she wanted more than anything, investing together with her. On top of that, she even said she loved me. She was smart, timid, but with strong convictions, and she had this dream of living as she pleased, something that a selfish person acting as they pleased would never think about. But Chris had finally made that dream come true, and her timing couldn't have been more perfect. I guess if I met her in town, we could chat as we used to, and even have dinner together. If it came to it, we could maybe even work together on some small things. But now, my life and Chris's would certainly not be tied together ever. I was now convinced of it. Just like when Eleanor had come to the orbital base to settle things once and for all, Chris had become a person of the past now, too. Strangely enough, I didn't get any sense of loss or despondency, either from the fact that I had failed in persuading Chris, or from the fact that Chris had finally left my side. I only had the feeling that things were meant to be this way, like a sensation of satisfaction at pieces falling into place. Now left alone in the church, I shook the small half-full bottle of beer lightly. Everyone was going forward. I grinned wryly as I thought that, realizing the reset told me the same thing four years ago. After laughing for a while, I heaved a small sigh. So now I was the only one left who had not completely given up on the past, huh? I called Gazanika on the phone and told him the results of the negotiations. Obviously, I didn't tell her about I didn't tell him about her plan to coup d'état within EJ Roachberg, but I told him that they would likely never back out, that he should keep in mind when negotiating with them. Gazaniga seemed to be at a loss for words, but he answered, understood. Well, there probably wasn't anything he could really say in this situation. I cut the phone call, turned off the lights in the room, closed the doors, and left the church. I also wanted to sell scores with what happened eight years ago. But I didn't know how to.